begin immediately. Don't mm -hmm. do not wait. Do not wait for it to be perfect. If that's your ambition, start exactly where you stand right this moment. Because mm -hmm. um, the best time to start was yesterday. The second best time is today. Hey, welcome guys. Thank you for being on the Artist Appeals. We are thrilled to be here. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I am so stoked. You guys are coming all the way from Key West, Florida. Southernmost tip, right? All the way down south. Yeah, southernmost in the continental United States. So brilliant, brilliant. So welcome to the show. Um, please just start by introducing yourself a little bit. Who are you and what do you do? Yeah. Well, uh, my name is Adam Russell, and this is my wife and creative partner, business partner, collaborator, mischief maker, um, mm -hmm. Kelly Lever. And we are um, together, probably better known as Key West Pottery. So um, we are uh, potters in a traditional sense, but also have kind of wandered off into the realms of ceramic fine art and, um, and kind of honored our own roots and really gotten back to painting and printmaking and kind of uh, just artists at large at this point, but um, online and on the street, we go by QS Pottery, so. Very cool. Well, welcome guys. I did not know you were making forays into the other uh, fields of art now as well. Yeah. So that was new to me. Exactly. Very cool. Well, our, our education is in. So yeah. um, we're both trained formally as painters. But oh, really? On yeah. Traditional oil paint. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've practiced yeah. most mediums in the two dimensional. Um, I was more printmaking and acrylic, uh, which I still continue to do. Yeah. So actually, the, cool. the pottery was kind of the foray outside of our educational realm many years ago at this point. You know what I mean? But um, but yeah, you know, so um, at this point, we kind of feel like just artists in general, craftspeople. <laughs> willing to make it happen with whatever's I love it. it. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So that leads actually directly into our very first rapid fire question, which is what is the number one thing you love to do or make? I love to paint. That's what I really, truly love. Painting the pots, painting on canvas, painting, making prints. Paint. Yeah. Very cool. And for me, I, I like, um, to explore scale in clay. Um, mm. I'm weirdly comfortable with working really large, um, which presents a whole whole host of challenges, firing space and um, connection processes and so on and so forth. But um, I just really developed a love for it. So uh, it's a little bit more sculptural and um, kind of architecture and scale or architectural in scale. But um, I'm using really traditional ways of making the pots. And so it's throwing pots, but it's these kind of, it's like me on a quest, you know, I'm trying to <laughs> challenge myself and, um, you know, continue to, you know, occupy a scale that I think is not super traditional. So very cool. Gilly, do you like to also paint large? Yes. Yeah, typically. Um... I mean, I have a couple canvases I just stretched a week or so ago, well, a pretty large scale, four feet, six feet. Um, but I, I like a range. I do like a range. You know, not everyone has room either for a yeah. four foot by six foot painting. So for our, yeah. uh, our gallery and what we do, I, I like to kind of hit multiple marks. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so the flip side of that is what is the one thing you guys hate to do? or make? Oh, good question. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> she said you go first. Um, you know, for me, I think that this probably is more um, related to personality than any difficulty. Um, I am not a very orthodox potter in the sense that I don't appreciate repetition in the way that many mm. do. I have a complete and deep respect for craftspeople who can sit down and rock 200 pieces that are identical. Um, yeah. Massively hard to do. It's, um, it's not that I've never done it. It's not that I won't do it again, but it's just not what, what tickles me. You know, I like 
one-offs, one-of-a-kind. I like expression um, in my work, both in two-dimensional and three-dimensional realms. Yeah. So um, every now and again, we'll get uh, we'll get opportunity to sit down and make 700 of something. And uh, that probably is the most difficult for me, but I think it's a quixotic personality, you know, that yeah. I'm just on to the next thing mentally. <laughs> you know? I think a lot of artists are like that. Yeah. 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 I definitely am. It's it's challenging for me. Um, but, you know, you see potters moving a, a wear board with 50 bowls on it, identical, and then they'll move another one and another one and another one. And it's fascinating to me. And um, I respect that deeply. It takes a focus. I then. never thought of that. I never thought of that from a pottery angle, but I have seen that, particularly at the craft shows. You know, they've got to have 100 mugs. Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And for me, geez. Uh, very strong word. So as he was chatting, I kind of was trying to rack my brain. I don't know if there's anything I really feel I hate. I think there's things that maybe I dislike a little bit more than others, but day to day, I know those things have to be done. And that's more the operational logistics portion of running an art business and art gallery doesn't come as easy to me. So I wouldn't say I hate it because it's, crucial to what we do and being able to do it here. Um, But it's harder for me, for sure, to have that. It's a different mindset. So Right. So which one of you does more of the logistic day-to-day operational stuff? Or is it 50-50? You know, it's it's definitely an informal balance for us. And this is something that we've we've talked about a lot in various podcasts and and blog posts and so on, is that um, our business uh, was not premeditated. This was not something that we had a whole, you know, bag of capital and decided a location and thought, oh, they need a pottery there. It grew <laughs> in a very, very organic way as it continues to. And, um, you know, for us, we're running more than one location with more than one aim. So um, the, the basis of Key West Pottery is we make all types of things. Right now, we're probably going in between 8,000 and 10,000 pots a year of varying sizes, right? So we, wow. do, we do coffee mugs. We do sculptural public art installations. We're a little bit all over the map, um, not necessarily by design, but because of marketplace and skill set with ourselves and our um, team mm-hmm. which has grown bigger over time. So um so the two primary facilities or prongs of the business is that we have a, a studio where Kelly and I both personally work, but we also have a production staff out there. Um, so the studio is uh, what you would call back of house. That's where we're making the sausage, so to speak, right? Right. So um, ordering out there is um, is all materials, tools, uh, techniques, importing information for our people so that they can, you know, inform each other and work well as a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of that logistic logistical support is, um, you know, I'm at the studio a little bit more than Kelly is, but we really share that. She's right. got contacts for getting the things down the seven, what is it? 37 bridges um, of the <laughs> four keys, right? It's, um, it's, quite, it's quite a hike for when you're, uh, you know, bringing in two tons of clay. Oh know? my gosh, I never thought about those logistics. Yeah, so Kelly handles a lot of that. And then at the gallery, the other prong is dressed up. It's clean. It's uh, branded. Um, you know, mm-hmm. the bags tell you where to come back to. Um, all of these things we've had to think of over time. And it's a team effort. But again, up there, our staff needs to communicate with each other. They need mm-hmm. the right information at the right time, point of sales systems, bank accounts, you know, ordering and everything. Um, so it's really kind of a mixed bag. We got a whole team that really helps us with it. I would say in terms of um, timing and ordering, Kelly's the uh-huh. boss and they know that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's it's a full plate. Wow. Kelly, where is the studio? So, I mean, I was down in Key West. We flew down. No, we took the auto train. And um, then drove those those bridges down for a day or two, which is how I found you guys. Um, yes. But where is the studio? Why is it on? It's up on the mainland. No, no, no. The studio is on the next island up. So, oh, uh, okay. So it's just, uh, yeah, one one bridge away. Um, 
but it's, and, and like Adam was saying, we have a whole staff out there as well as the gallery. So um, as far as logistics wise, just coordinating, you know, right. Um, right. But yeah. yeah, we, like he said, we have a really wonderful staff and we feel really blessed to have the team that we do that we can be making that, you know, if you did come in the gallery, you know, we have 500 mugs on display on that, you know, we gorgeous. Have, like the, the, the product there. And, um, mm-hmm. we couldn't do it without our, our team. Yeah. Your staff was so sweet and so friendly. And that display of mugs is like right in the middle. So you've got the one side, which is, you know, kind of one theme. And then you've got the other side with the big pots on, um, pedestals. It, it's really beautiful and impressive. Thank you. Okay, so what is your number one top selling piece? I like to ask this of people because sometimes it's unexpected, their response. Like, what is the one product or one thing or one design that has um, made you the most money? Mm-hmm. It's a good question. Honestly, um, I feel like there's there's actually two prongs to it because of where we are and what we do. I would okay. say large scale work really is. Well, the large scale work is where we make the most money. Well. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So it's caught on and it's, um, you know, we've been fortunate in that way, you know, that we've engineered it such that these artworks are sent literally all over the world and um, they can be cared for pretty easily. Um, so it's the same material. See, that's the thing. Um, you know, if we take 50 pounds of clay and make, you know, an expensive sculpture, it would be um, quite a different margin um, business-wise than if we took that 50 pounds of clay and made whatever it would be, 50 miles yeah. from it. Um, so in terms of um, business, uh, you know, the sculptures do quite well. However, right. most people coming into the gallery have no idea who we are. Um, we are on the main street in Key West, Florida, and the entire world is coming through our door. And um, not everyone is interested in a sculpture that costs many thousands of dollars. Right. So, but they all drink coffee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> in terms of quantity yeah. and in terms of, um, you know, success with building an audience, which I think mm-hmm. is absolutely foundational. Mm-hmm. And it's a harder metric. Um, it's, it's not as easy to calculate as the dollars and cents are. But uh, in terms of quantity and meeting people mm-hmm. and developing reputation and rapport, I would say mm-hmm. coffee mugs, but specifically we have this one coffee mug and it's the rooster mug. The rooster okay. Mug. So we have yep. been <laughs> making it for mug. 12 years. I should have yeah. known. Key yeah. West yeah. roosters. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's chickens everywhere. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, it's a, it's a great mm-hmm. reminder. You know, I joke with people often that I can draw that chicken faster than I can write my name. <laughs> so, you know, we've done it so many times. It's become such a staple of the shop um, that I can't tell you how many countless thousands of them we've done, but <laughs> you know, it's one of these things that for artists in business with a team who rely on us, who rely on this vision, who rely on um, the marketplace as well. When you have something that works, it's like, you need to embrace it. And it's not mm-hmm. gimm- gimmicky or touristy. It's made with integrity, but um, people are really drawn to it. And we've tried iterations and variations on it. And mm-hmm. the, um, the original color scheme and so on is just the most popular. So yeah. it's like, you know, it's not broke. Don't fix it. Right. <laughs> so, so. I think that's such great advice. You know, the idea that you need to have a high price product yeah. and a repeatable low price product that people just love and are drawn to. That is fantastic advice. Thank yeah. you. So what's the funniest or weirdest experience as professional artists that you've ever had? Oh, Lord. Oh, wow. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I mean. I would say for me, what first came to my head was the iguanas coming into the pottery shop. And it's frantic iguana out of your gallery space with all breakable things. Yeah. That's, oh my gosh. That's not necessarily like a funny studio moment or <laughs> practicing the art moment, but yeah. Yeah. No. Oh no. my God. Like a bull in a China shop, except it's an iguana in a, in a, exactly, exactly. a China shop. We, we, yeah. we have those videos posted throughout the Instagram history. They're probably pretty deep now, but every now and again, 
um, we'll have some strange Key West visitor, you know, a, a rooster yeah. will come in. Um, yeah. We've had, we've had <laughs> like a, probably a three and a half foot graceful, beautiful, calm white heron walk right into the front door. <laughs> I mean, this is, I'm talking this is Main Street. This is, this is permanent traffic jam during our heavy season. Yeah. Right? Busy town. Um, you know, in this ballerina of a creature, you know, this heron oh, wow. walks in and it's just like he's shopping. I was yeah. like, okay, well, you know, he let himself right back out to the iguana know. was not shopping. Uh, iguana, <laughs> the thing about iguana it, it is it was the drunk tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they get a little frantic. Um, if you feel cornered, but if you try to chase them out, they will immediately corner themselves. <laughs> So there's this whole display of shop owner with a broom gently <laughs> trying to um, evacuate an iguana. And when they get close enough to the door, you have to give them a little encouragement. Right? <laughs> oh, and, my uh, God. And so, by, you know, people passing by, there's just a quaint little gallery front door <laughs> and the giant green liz- lizard shoots out of it. <laughs> So, um, if you can so, you yeah. imagine if you were on the sidewalk on that end, exactly. <laughs> the receiving end, yeah. yeah. Um, no iguanas were hurt in the production no. of this. Oh my god, uh, I find those things scary. I mean, they're big and they look like yeah. dragons, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're, they're um, easily confused as well. <laughs> so, it's um, it's, it's quite an event when it happens, but I would say, beyond oh, wow. that, just some of the bloopers of the gallery and so on. Um, you know, when when you're an artist, especially during installs, whether they're uh, public in nature, we do work with resorts or in people's homes, you know what I mean? Uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot of, you got to stand and deliver on the spot, right? Mm. You're going to encounter mm-hmm. something unusual. There's mm-hmm. an unusual substrate underneath the sidewalk. There's, you don't have the tool you need, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, so there's some sweaty moments every now and again. You know what I mean? When uh, you they have, do. yeah, you know, when you when you have it's the work is done, the work is solid and it's great, but now we have to fit the shoe on the foot, right? Um mm. you just have to assess right then and there and involve um the people who are present, whether it's your assistants or your buyers and collectors, it's to let them know the process that you are currently figuring out. So it's a little bit of a Rubik's cube. Um, right. It can result, you know, sometimes in in funny moments or doing things that weren't necessary. But when we put the artworks up, it's got to be super solid. It's got to be so- generationally solid, and that just takes a little a little zest on the spot. <laughs> so, you know, I appreciate that. I've taken some classes. I took a bronze casting class many many years ago, and it was like a puzzle. It was like you figured one aspect, and then you had to figure out the next aspect. Then you had to figure out the next aspect and then you had to figure out how to display it. And it was, it was, it was like a mechanical engineering problem more so than a puzzle because it just, things don't necessarily snap together. It's like, how am I going to, yeah, I can't imagine how you display those giant, huge sculptures you make, which are gorgeous, but are fragile. If they fall over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. And you know what? I was really fortunate that early at an earlier stage of my career, I was working in public arts administration and um, not as an artist, but as an administrator working with senior artists who, okay. um, who we would commission artworks and we would, um, we would conserve artworks. And so when you're conserving artworks or you're commissioning them, one of the biggest things is of course, how it looks, how it remembers someone you're memorializing, you know, all the aesthetic okay. traits of art, but also, on the back end, is this safe? How does this actually work? What does mm. it look like in 50 years? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. How does it a part in case of damage? Can a kid climb on it? You know, all of these things, right? Um, and so that came pretty early on after art school for me. And I was able to okay. transfer some of that knowledge um, into what I do now. So yeah, it's important, but um, we think about it really, really thoroughly and in a professional manner. Uh, but like I say, sometimes you're on the site and it's like, oh, they changed something, <laughs> you know, and you have to be quick on your feet to do it. Right, right. So um, what is the most important piece of business advice you would give yourself, your younger self? You know, this traditional question, if you were to go back to when you're just starting out, if there's something you could tell yourself, what would that really important piece of advice be? 
might be take a business class because yeah. <laughs> as an artist you know you probably think or I know I do think a little different or abstractly or you know so to get the knowledge of how to be successful in the every day and make a living from what you love you know which is the life I think every artist or every human should want or wants yeah um, but it's the dream uh, yeah knowing how to you know run a business I think is really really important Hey, yeah, I get you. That's why I started this podcast because, you know, I was a teacher for years and years and years, a college professor, have a master's degree. And do we talk about business in the art world? Not really. It's like a, it's like a blip. It's like a byline. (laughs) Yeah, and it's, it's tricky because I think that, um, you know, especially for, or at least in my opinion, art school is, it's so, um, rich in technique and, oh yeah um, and motive and, and it's so much fun yeah and history you know it's like I, my, my one thing for artists coming up or myself back then i would say you need to look at art mm-hmm. you need to look mm-hmm. at other people's work and learn how to enjoy artworks not always deconstruct them to see how it was made and that's also fun yeah. um, as a craftsperson but learn the context that surrounds any one given of artwork, piece of artwork that you're just drawn to. When you're drawn to something, whether it's 150 years old or it came out yesterday, it's like learn what relevance it has, you know, um, as specific or vague as that may be, you know. But, yeah. but the classic piece of advice for older self starting business is begin immediately. Don't mm-hmm. do oh. not wait. Do not wait for it to be perfect. If that's your ambition, start exactly where you stand right this moment mm-hmm. um because the best time to start was yesterday the second best t- time is today mm-hmm. so. best time to plant fruit trees was yesterday yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Kind of oh. time, but yeah very cool very cool um all right so thank you for that let's do the whole art part so Um, You guys are sculptors, but painters now as well. Um, Tell me just a little bit about how you found your niche, because you have such an interesting niche and this amazing gallery and space and location. How tell me how you came to be in Key West and making pottery. Uh, Well, Kelly and I are both from Toledo, Ohio. Um, that area, and we met at the Bowling Green, Bowling Green State University School of Art. Um, and during that time, I was working an internship with the Arts Commission in Greater Toledo, and that's kind of you know that reference I made earlier about arts administration. Um, I was helping them throughout our art school, and then once I graduated, I was working with them in an administrative capacity, which um, was tough for me in some regards because I'm not the most a traditionally organized person. And this is a very efficient uh, office workspace. It's dynamic and cool. And I'm so grateful for the uh, experience. Um, At the time, I was really trying to build the studio practice. Um, And it essentially became a second job for me. I would work the full day and then really be pushing, at that time, paintings. um, Okay. Hunting out... um, exhibition space and galleries and shows and, you know, kind of the classic story. Yeah. Um, the traditional route yeah, we're all kind of hear about. Exactly. Um, and it's a little bit mysterious and it remains mysterious um, to me even today. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the time I was getting this great post art school education in the real world as an arts administrator um, and it was a number of years and I enjoyed that work. It was hard work for me because it was, it's all about being timely and having the documents. And, you know, I respect people who are doing this work because the art world would grind to a halt if it were people like me running it. Right. <laughs> um, because I like to be in the studio all hours of the night in the morning, whenever, but when I don't want to be there, I like to leave. You know, I don't yep. like to force it. I want to be in the creative space. Yeah. Um, so as part of the kind of second career path I was pursuing at the time, I saw an opportunity for um, an art an artist residency in Key West. But the kind oh. of the interesting thing about it is that they were also 
offering residencies to um, cultural managers because this organization here in town was just getting started and they were bringing in different administrators from all over the world just to kind of powwow and to talk about how, how did you build it in Barcelona? How did you, what got built in Toledo when you were there? You know, all of these different things. And so I applied actually as a cultural manager because I was more confident in that realm as a professional at the moment. Um, so a cultural manager, i.e. they wanted you to help build the art scene? Is that what I'm understanding? Well, maybe not as, not as didactic as that. I don't okay. think that, that was the express purpose, but I think it was more of just the inherent understanding that when you get a bunch of creative people mm -hmm. in the room who have had success in the sense that they've also been through difficulties, they've seen their program change over time, because right. success does not come without failure. And the failure mm. part is hard to see coming unless you have experienced people around you. And so I really think that it was wise of them. Um, they've grown and they're do doing a great job even still um, all these years later, but they just brought administrators in to talk about how they've done it and just talk and just enjoy this wonderful place and just get people here. Um, Fantastic. So I had applied for that part and ultimately through conversation with the then executive director, they invited me down as an artist and they said, Hey, listen, you know, come down and paint. We're going to give you a month in Key West. Um, nice. Put us up in this gorgeous little apartment that at the time I never could have afforded uh, probably even a week at. Um, we had a three-year-old at the time and Kelly was pregnant with number two. So we all came down, which is not the traditional approach to um, artist residencies. And for anyone listening, I'm not sure if they run it that way now or not. I just genuinely don't know. But, um, but we all came down. And I think that that was a really important moment because it showed me um, a professional artist's view in a different marketplace, you know? Mm. So I have been involved in a more urban um, art world. Um, in Toledo, Ohio, which is fantastic, but it's got a totally different flavor than imagine here. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I could just see a little opening for us here. I could see how it could possibly work. You know, there's money exchanging hands and so on and so forth. And that was the big problem for us. It's like, how do you make money from this, this work? I can make the work. I love to make the work, but how does it hit the marketplace? Um, you know, without having 50 galleries spread out all over the world. How does this work? What's a more direct route? And uh, long story short, I kind of started to see that in Key West. And I think that Kelly did too. So on the long drive back. Oh, God, Ohio, how long was that? Like about 24 hours. It is 24 oh. hours. Yeah. Um, With a three-year-old and pregnant? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, God, you must have had to stop worth, like uh, it was worth it yeah <laughs> but um kelly and i had essentially developed the same question for each other where we were quiet didn't say anything and by the time we started to see the snow blow sideways across our windshield you know, <laughs> we were like do you think you could make it work down there you know we had to ask each other that and yeah. so settle we had I, can't, I mean, I can't even tell you that we had zero dollars to spend on this. There was no capital. There was no foresight. But we went back and um, to our loving community in Toledo, Ohio, which um, we still are a part of. We told everyone, hey, we're out. <laughs> you know, we're gonna, we're Peace gonna out, yo. We're, we're going out. to Key West. We're going to try it because if we don't try it now, we probably won't. You know, and we we're like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're pregnant with number two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That so, is fantastic. I mean, yeah. that is the question. How do you make money as an artist? Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of this conversation and this podcast is how do you make money as an artist? So you saw a more direct route to the consumer in Key West, huh? Well, yeah. Well, and part of that story, too, is we had already been doing we I used to teach ceramics for a nonprofit in uh, the Toledo area. Right, so right. I was trained as a painter, but I've done ceramics since I was like five. So I was teaching ceramics at the time. And we were already selling our wares and starting to collaborate on them together. So I would make work, he would paint it. And um, we had already a very small, small business doing that, but we were doing art fairs and such like that. So okay. we came to Key West. Um, we had our three-year-old, I was pregnant. We had our little chihuahua and like 
as much pottery as we could have made and put in the van that we could. And okay. we had our shows in Delray Beach. Um, we were in a fair there and in honestly, West, but, and one in Key West. And we weren't originally supposed to have one in Key West, but they asked us to, and we were like, sure. So yeah, um, we ended up selling the majority of the work in Key West before going to the original yeah. fair that we were supposed to have our wares at. Um, so you didn't have any inventory left? <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Not as much as we had hoped, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, it just also showed us that there's a good community of artists down here. Um, a lot of great painters, a lot. There was a, at the time, there's not anymore, a ceramic program at the community college down it's here. Similar. In transition right It's now, in transition. It She's the, the head of it just retired. Um, but it's a great program, great facility. Um, but we kind of had had noticed that there wasn't a ton of potters on the island. Um, and our work was really well responded to on the island. So it kind of, we... Yeah, well, you I know, love I'm, that you guys were aware that you, you know, took note of those things. I love well, that. Well, I can look back and say it. <laughs> was I aware? I'm probably not that aware. I was just like, let's let's give it a go. We want, we really want to make something work. We know we want to. Well, there's a there's a very uh, seductive value to the island. I mean, yeah. just just as a place to be. Exactly. It's, it's beautiful and lush, and um, you know, people are typically in a pretty good mood here. <laughs> so it was uh, kind of just what we were looking for at that life stage exactly. yeah. in, in multiple different ways. But um, I could see what now actually seems to me like a, a much more conventional way. I could see the direct to consumer model. And this is be way before Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that had helped so many artists. I mean, you know, right. And Instagram and social media in general has created a platform for people like us to go directly to who's interested um, now. But back then, that seemed like how do you let people know? Mm -hmm. Like how do you yeah. how do you how do you get in front of them? You know, and Key West is a spot where, for varying reasons, the people are already here, right? All you have yeah. to do is set up, and the people are just casually walking by so it's more about um i guess what is called conversion where it's people are up there like oh look at these little guys in their pottery you know yeah Pure pottery literally started on the back of a bicycle i mean i kid you oh, really built a milk crate on the back of a bike yeah well, yeah only a, only a couple well, steps more yeah. sophisticated yeah. than a milk crate but <laughs> I had created a, with the help of a really dear friend and mentor at the time, I'd created a um, mobile gallery experience because we had nothing to go on to begin with, except for the vibe, a lot of great advice and support from people who weren't going to let us fall flat on our face, but gave us enough leash to um, make the mistakes, you know what I mean? To do it the hard way. And keep right. getting better. So, um, so that's how we started Key West Pottery, which essentially is we make all the work in house, um, and we go direct to our collectors um, yeah. via our own um, gallery space, our own website, our own mechanism. Which back then seemed less conventional than it does now, but um, it's a yeah. great way to just go for it. You know what I mean? That that's way, fantastic. Yeah, you know your collector that way. Um, I do show with some other galleries and I, res I respect them too. Um, but, you know, to really get in front of people, you learn so much about your own work because once you make something, you put it in the world, it no longer belongs to you. I don't know who said that, but it hit me a couple of years ago. And I really believe that because um, it's all about people's connection to your work and mm. special moment belongs to them. It belongs to mm. the artwork, you know, and you get to learn about that more when you're standing there as it happens, <laughs> mm. my opinion, my opinion. Um, so, yeah. so that was the story of QS for us. Yeah. It's like, that's how we got to where we're at now. Oh growth. my gosh. You guys are such easy guests, man. Cause I normally have to prompt people with art, product, presentation. Like we, we kind of stick to this appeals acronym, art, right. product, cool. presentation, educate, amplify. I swear to God, you've covered half of it already. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's you guys a solid are method. It's a solid method. <laughs> yeah. You know, you gotta 
Oh, right. thanks. Well, I was just trying to classify a lot of information. So uh, you've got product, you've got these beautiful paintings and mugs and high-end stuff. So you've got yeah. the full range of prices and then you've got this presentation. I love how you're talking about going straight to market and like removing that middleman. I mean, galleries can traditionally take 50%, right? Yeah. And you know, honestly, now that I run a gallery, I can understand why. It's um, mm. it's a lot. It's quite an A lot of overhead. Yeah. And, and for me, I was never necessarily trying to cast them in the light of a middleman. It was mm-hmm. more like, um, how do you, for a young artist, which we were then, I regret to say that the word young is ebbing into the background of my life now, but... Um, nah, you guys are still young. Yeah, well, I feel like it. Just, so, um, In my own mind, I'm still 27. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know what age you are, but I'm just going to stop there. Yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. Um, but at that time I was worried less about the middleman who had happily pay for their hard work. Right. Yeah. It was just about how to, um, create a large enough network in that world, um, to be truly, truly self-sustaining in an economic sense for our family. And, right. and the, um, I don't know, some of the things that you want for your children, you know, opportunities, um, mm-hmm. and so on, you know, that was, more of the challenge, not necessarily right. 50% middleman, which I'm happy to pay if, if they can produce, you know what I mean? Um, but it was just, how do you get yeah. enough? You know, how do you yeah. get those folks, you know? No, I get it because uh, yeah, I mean, that is kind of the dream I think for a lot of artists um, is to find somebody, an art agent or a gallery that will just take your work and put it out there and pay you yeah. and yeah, I think that's a good that's question happened. is how many galleries do you need? Right. Or how many, you know, pieces do, uh, yeah, how many galleries do you need if you're going to be self-sustaining? Totally. Um, so we did art, we did product. Do you have any tips or tricks for presentation, just technical stuff or like even hiring tips and tricks since you've got a gallery that you're running you've got to have staff and they're presenting your work what tips or tricks could you maybe give people about that end of it i say when it comes to hiring and bringing on um, staff that not only are going to represent your work in your absence or in our case we have that and help create the work um, with us just to follow your gut and your intuition and make sure that your staff has similar values and principles and to also make sure that they have are having their needs met as far as communication, open communication, making sure that they have clear, um, you know, daily goals or like just trying to be the best leader that you can while also being genuine and true and knowing you want the work represented in that way, you know, that it, it needs to feel genuine and feel. um, Yeah. It's just, it's it's just about, I think, authenticity Mm -hmm. with people. You know what I mean? It's, it's what I expect of them. um, But it's what I, I have to give that to them. And it seems a little bit um, kind of vanilla and kind of a, a, a real easy thing to say, um, but it's much easier said than done because, you know, to really, to sometimes be in a rush and have some urgency and have um, things happening behind the scenes, you know, that, that don't have to involve the entire staff, you know, but mm-hmm. this is what I'm working on over here, but they, they need us to, to feel them. You know, so that they can mm. do the work. When I bring when I bring the work to them, um, you know, I want them to feel it. I want to know what they think. Mm. You know what I mean? Because that ultimately is what gets represented. Mm. And I want to mm. that. And so there was a lot for me in earlier years, a lot of letting go. You know what I mean? And saying, mm. hey, at some point, you gotta let smart people do their work. You know? Right. Right. And, uh, and trust them. And and these things are again, easier said than done, but mm-hmm. we're, we're lucky that we've gotten to work with a ton of really smart people who taught us about that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But that's, you know, you learn leadership by leading mm-hmm. and, um, and you get in 
embarrassed sometimes. <laughs> you put your mouth and um, there's a couple of really important words that you need to know. And it's, I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Let's try this again. This time, what do you think? And collaboration, you know, mm. uh, as we get better at that, it becomes easier and it becomes a, a like a well-oiled machine at moments, which is a yeah. cool feeling, <laughs> yeah. which is a really cool <laughs> feeling, you know, to, to, to know that growth is possible. Um, mm. And these folks are invested with us. And that's amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. they're, they're not our assistants. They're our colleagues, mm-hmm. you know. I know you guys do a lot of social media too. You do a lot of um, educating with the social media and stuff like that. So how do you be consistent in posting and creating that content and coming up with new ideas all the time? Yeah. This it's, guy right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. It's, it's tough. It's, um, it's a moving target as I think a lot of artists are, are I'm seeing a popular discussion right now about, algorithms and and this kind of this change that's happening and the platforms you know themselves as businesses have different uh, motivations um yeah control that part it's like uh surfing you know um, but, ah, but it's like say, riding the ocean waves huh yeah yeah, yeah. you just I like that analogy go with it and sometimes you biff one pretty hard and other times it gets picked up and you don't even know why there's just momentum behind it mm-hmm. um, and I feel like that is um, either by design or by accident. I can't tell, but it's like, you just kind of have to realize that the point is to communicate clearly. Mm. Um, and for artists and for me specifically, it's to communicate in an emotional way. And I don't mm. mean emotional, like, oh, this mushy thing, but it's just like, yo guys here, like I'm out here as a person. I'm not talking to you as a company, you know, yeah. it was a corporate bulletin. Right. This is me in my real life with my kids, my craft, my partners. You know what I mean? Like we're yeah. creating this stuff. And I want to know from you so badly what you think. So tell me. I'm listening, you know. Um, and then to to be there, you know, to actually be have a human presence behind your um your product. I see a lot of a lot of things coming through and people are trying to talk at some company level, and it's hard to penetrate because. It's almost like we have seen that model so often in magazines and, you know, in, in traditional media and um, in social media is uh, so much easier to be authentic and mm. just be social and talk and be like, ah, you know, uh, so I would say that. And the, the next thing is you, you have to know how to take a decent picture. And it's not <laughs> hard to find out. It's not hard, hard. You can do it. There's there's online classes and so on. But that is the tip of the day especially for um, someone making a three-dimensional object that you're trying mm-hmm. to represent in a two-dimensional screen. Um, yeah. You, you got to know how to learn and you got to know how to take a decent photograph. Um, What's your favorite camera? Or what do you use? You know what? I really actually use a lot of just my iPhone. Um, they've become really good. They've become really good. The rest of the staff has one too. So when they have a question, we can talk on a very, um, you know, we can talk on a platform that has common. Use FaceTime? Uh, we, use, we use FaceTime, we use whatever. But if I do something on my phone and I'm at the studio three miles away, I can say to our gallerist, um, hey, do this, lighten it by tapping here, pulling up, you know what I mean? And they don't have to be an expert, but it's really as much about the setting you're taking the photograph in, mm. what's the background, more importantly, what's not in the background, <laughs> <laughs> how it's fit, um, glare, so on and so forth. Um, mm-hmm. It's pretty straightforward and nuts and boltsy. It's not, um, it's not expressive in the sense of the expression is in the pot, okay? Now we want to represent this pot well online. Um, so I would say that that is a major tip because when I was able to kind of crack that code um, and be able to represent the work well enough, people started looking, mm-hmm. you know, so. Right. So do you do that for every piece? Like, I mean, not the mugs, but like every big piece you make, you you photograph it and you do you film the making of all of your big pieces? I don't film the making of all of them. I regret to say I probably should. Um People love that aspect of it. And that's probably another great tip for this little section. 
um, you know, people, the creative moment is why we're in this, right? Mm. We're as collectors or artists. It's like, it's that flow state creative moment. Yeah. Someone dance really well, even if you Mm. can't dance and I can't, (laughs) um, (laughs) It's a brilliant moment to see an experience. It's it's seeing, you know, the guy on stage with the guitar just go nuts. Like, that's what you want. Yeah. Um, so to show people and share people or share that with people, I think is profoundly important. But um, yeah, you know, I would say we photograph almost everything, but um, mm-hmm. every once in a while, some will slip by. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a lot of work shuffling back and forth. That's so. what I was doing for two hours before. Yeah. Oh, really? I, yeah. I do a lot. I I do. He does more of the social media content, mm-hmm. the, the live um, videos, the process shots. The um, but I do take care of the online e-commerce yeah. portion, which is photographing each piece and um, making sure that they're represented well online. Of course, mm-hmm. it's really important when you're selling art. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a little studio, like a permanent setup and like a um, kind of system that you use now? You would laugh at it, but yes. <laughs> Just look at the Not? Car, you turn out okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it was, yeah. Um, it's a quasi storage, quasi just a catch all in the gallery, but yeah. I can control the lighting and have nice lighting. And um, I know how to with that setup, edit them uh, appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. Lighting's the number one, man, right? Lighting is number one. I've got a course on how to photograph your art that I teach at Art Biz Jam and all these different places and it's online. And, you know, it's not the camera. It's the lighting. You can use an iPhone, but if you don't have good lighting, forget it. You're photographing something shiny. Oh, Yeah vessel it becomes even trickier you know so it's just learning how to yeah. you know do you uh, use a black fill like black fabric um to catch that reflection no, or you just use um, diffusers i they i do have diffusers and they're i have to point them in different directions it's backlit mm-hmm. um the space is an all white space because i like the color to show um mm-hmm. the light bulbs chosen as well more the Temperature. temperature and yep uh, yep daylight bulbs. light bulbs very good yeah. and a pedestal or um obviously a tripod to keep it consistent yeah. um point of view but fantastic yeah. you know i know that when i was in the gallery one of the things that did catch me was your beautiful video you had this big screen up behind the desk and you had these beautiful black and white videos of you guys in the studio, throwing pots or laughing, you know, I I remember there was some slow-mo or something too. And I was just like, yeah, that's sexy. That's hot, man. (laughs) Media turns me on. What can I say? (laughs) So very cool. So you do a lot of um, wonderful, wonderful work. So art, product, presenting it, right? Educating and communicating with your customers and with your staff and then amplifying and getting bigger. You know, you were talking about how Key West is this wonderful place because you get a lot of people just strolling right in and how you discovered that. Are there any other um, softwares or apps or systems that you just love for helping you get more done with less work? Mm. Yeah, um, you know, it for us it's a lot more strategy. We're we're pretty analog, really, as craft craftspeople. <laughs> I mean, we're we're integrated into digital. Well, you are hands-on. I mean, yeah. sculpture is literally the original hands-on medium. <laughs> well, most well, of them are, but well, you know, I would just say that, especially for artists, it's like uh, you know, the people who are really gonna add buoyancy to your program whether that's a, a gallery program or an independent, you know, artist selling online mm-hmm. um, or craft shows and so on. Um, they like to be involved. They like to feel a part of it. And indeed, when they're involved, um, there's a very kind of a symbiotic relationship, you know, where so much of what I've learned about my own work has come out of the mouth of someone who, who is looking. Um, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's a field that you can never know everything about. And there's a part of ourselves that I really believe is invisible to us, 
we're so used to inhabiting this person, this personality. We're so used to doing things a certain way. Yeah, so you're in this vessel. It's the only exactly, one you get. Exactly. Yeah, another pottery meta- metaphor, right? What is that? <laughs> Sorry, bad pun. <laughs> but um, but when when you're able to to see from the outside, it's a very valuable moment, you know. So it's um, there's a kind of a self interested part of this too, where um, people will talk about your work. People will talk about you as the creator. Um, whether you want them to or not. So you might as well involve them in the conversation and and talk with them and and learn about this thing with them, whether that is on an app or that is in person. Um, I think it's really important. Um, And it's tough for some artists. We're sometimes introverted. We're Mm. quiet maybe sometimes. Um, But for us, at least, people have been so overwhelmingly generous and kind and truly mm-hmm. interested, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that I think is a rare place in most professions, you know what I mean? To have this dialogue possible just at the drop of a dime, you know, intelligent, good people. Mm-hmm. So so do you ask for referrals or testimonials a lot? I'm kind of reframing this a little bit. You say you are really listening to your customers, which is great advice. And then are you resharing that? Um, at appropriate moments. Yeah. You know, um, I, I don't like to pander for, um, compliments online. I know a lot of businesses. Yeah. No, that's to their benefit. And that's fine with me. That's uncomfortable. You're right. It's hard in that way. You know what I mean is, is actually, I think like just in the most sincere way, just like being open, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I'm not an artist because I've had this grand idea that's going to change the world. Unfortunately, that has not occurred to me yet, right? It's like, <laughs> I'm an artist to participate. And, and Kelly is an artist because we're participating in this life together. And it's interesting. And, right. it's like, um, and to hear back from people is fascinating, especially when they have the chance to do so. Whether that's an online review or just a long conversation, long after they've bought the piece, you know, and we've become friends years later. It's a, it's a real thing. Um, and that I think is about the best representation you can do for yourself. It's just being who you are, but being open, you know, this is about dialogue and conversation. And then also, again, looking at other people's work and being their patron, you know what I mean? Going and involving yourself on the other side of the aisle, not as the artist, but as the collector, as the interested one. Mm -hmm. So really just engaging is what you're saying, to just engage and be in there with the people and with other people's work too, other artists as well, is how you like to scale. Yeah. And I I guess- Yeah, please. um, Amplify was the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would would say too is on, on another side of the coin for art and business is no risk, no reward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, without taking the next step, you won't know if you're where, you know, you won't get ahead if you, if you just stay stagnant, you know, even with in relationship with customer relationship with, you know, the business or the art or, um, yeah, I would just say no risk, no reward too. I mean, you have to put yourself out there to be able to, receive and grow and you know scale as well yeah Mm -hmm. yeah well i use the a in appeals to kind of um combine the word amplify and automate because this is where i like to try and talk a little bit about you know those things we have so much to do as entrepreneurs you know what I mean? Like, and it's overwhelming. And sometimes I think as an artist entrepreneur with the amount of things you have to do, you got to look for systems and apps and learn how and, to delegate. Yeah. <laughs> learn how to delegate. <laughs> God, that's so hard. Yeah. yeah. It is. It is, that's part of letting go. Yeah. yeah. It's part of letting go. Right. So engage with customers, engage with other artists, delegate. I love it. Those are really good actionable tips, though. Like they're simple without being technical. You know, sometimes I get people on and we talk about like <laughs> the latest, greatest software. But I think yours are accessible to anybody. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So cool. So art product, presentation, educate, amplify with automation. 
L for licensing and contract terms. Do you guys ever license any of your work? I mean, since you're direct to the consumer, you don't really have to hit this avenue, but you still have to have contracts and business acumen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was going to use that word. And then I was like, eh. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, we, we do, we've done, we've done some kind of things brushing against licensing world and, and reproductions and different realms. Um, it's not, it's not my specific area of, um, interest really, um, nothing wrong with it. It's just not what I do, but, um, in terms of being able to read a contract mm -hmm. and be able to negotiate terms on anything, whether it's, uh, um, yeah you know, leasing or mortgaging or, or whatever, you know, space, yeah. space to a creative endeavor. Like what we have is very important Yeah, um, to be able to represent yourself well um, mm -hmm. and, and recognize the legalese and, you know, and realize if you're in a good situation, people are not trying to trick you with this. Mm -hmm. They're not no. written a certain way um, in order that all parties are protected. If it's a if it's a professionally made honest contract, it can still be a little bit wordy and a little bit, <laughs> you know, it's not my favorite part of the week. But um, but you got to know how to navigate that area. Otherwise, um, maybe you don't get the best deal, or you don't get the you know yeah. you know. What are some tips you would offer for reading these contracts for for navigating these? Um, you know. For example, I just like to include this because I think a lot of artists and creatives are scared of contracts and scared of the legalese in these contracts. So I like to try and talk about it in plain English, you yeah. know, um, I had one artist talking about how she reads it backwards. Like she starts at the end and reads it backwards to trick herself into like paying attention or something. Um yeah. Yeah. You know, and you talked about earlier how you were in the administrative world and there was safety stuff. So I imagine with some of your big pieces, you might have uh, contracts or things about the installation for the purchase of these big uh, commission pieces or installation pieces. Can you share just a little bit of maybe what you look for or ways you trick yourself <laughs> into getting it done? I, I would say just make sure who you're going into contract with you guys have already had clear communication and then as far yeah. as reading the legal documents that just takes a fine tooth comb and yeah. time and patience to make sure that everything is in place but say so just make sure that the contract you're or person you're going into contract with yeah. is on the same page because yeah and i know well, that's what a contract is is a, a mutually acceptable goal to both parties um, mm -hmm. it's change so as long as i think what kelly's saying is as long as there's no hidden agenda suspected you know what i mean this should be pretty straightforward you know um but what i always tell like my kids or whoever it's just like if you don't know find out exactly you know? look it yeah. up ask someone who does know call a lawyer you know, um, don't ask their advice, pay them for their time. But um, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, um, if it's something that really, really matters or is very, very expensive or would leave you way hung out to dry if it went bad, get some real advice. It's it's worth every penny, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then, you know, more times once you develop a vocabulary for that, um, you can see what it is and why it's there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I have to give right. you insurance it's like oh well you know if there's a major accident on a construction site it would cost at least that much i was just reading those documents this morning <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i imagine you have liability insurance on the gallery and yeah. Yeah. all that yeah. type of stuff do you have a standard contract that you use as sculptors just for collectors you know no. what, we, don't, we don't really everything um that we do especially commission work which um i don't i don't do as much commission work as I used to mm -hmm. uh, for, for a very specific reason. I still do it, um, but they're so tailor-made. They're so site-specific or specific to uh, the company, group, collector, individual, whoever it is that I'm working with. Uh, that's usually something that we could come to an equitable accord on one-on-one um, -on -one without, without having this kind of boilerplate thing like sign here. We're just not that big. You know what I mean? This right. is is um still made 
with these tools right here. You know what I mean? We're um, we're a by hand and by contract business. And someone told me I gotta once, I gotta ask this because we're talking about commission a little bit. I've asked this of um, Owen Garrett and John Sidarius and some of these other um, artists about their commission process, like just like step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, yeah. And I'd never asked, asked a sculptor before. So yeah. what is the commission process for a sculptor? Just, you know, a real high level overview of, you know, this is what we do, this, 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 this. You know, I would say that most times when we get into the conversation about commission work, it's based off of some artwork that I've previously made. Okay. Um, don't do sculptures of someone's cat or, you know what I mean? It's just not <laughs> ideal, right? Like I, I make my work and they've encountered it somewhere in the world, maybe um, yeah. another director, or a resort, whatever. And so a lot of times there's a question based on something I've already made. And sometimes that work is old, you know, sometimes it's 10 years old and I've kind of moved on. Um, so there's a kind of a fun educational conversation to begin with. Like, hey, listen, you know, this is um, what I'm making now that is certainly born out of that same momentum. And so we're trying to educate them about the body of work I'm making now. So okay. that I don't get stuck doing the same thing forever and ever and ever. Um, okay. you know, after that, we just, uh, for me right now, I have to protect my time. Um, mm -hmm. and it can be easy to become overwhelmed with commissions. And that's a step in our, Genesis that I did not see coming. I did not realize that if you take on too many commissions, you actually can hold up the progression of your own work you're interested in pursuing. Interesting. Because yeah. I know commissions can be very lucrative. Of course. Yeah. And and hence the reason why you would take on so many, right? Yeah. But they're also very time consuming and um, they, they involve a lot more back and forth in communication, at least in the way we practice. Um, yeah sure at the end everyone is satisfied with the outcome so so i set the bar a little bit higher my commission list right now just because if my gallery on duval street is empty of the work then we're losing right it's like right. I have, that's the priority i have to keep that going and that's truly what i enjoy the most but um but after that we decide a price we decide you know i make very simple sketches because i always like to tell my okay. clients as a sculptor the magic happens when i'm sculpting you know what I mean? It's not about this drawing to begin with, but we can get color principles, have a touchstone there that we've both agreed on. Okay. Um, as we make the work, um, that's where the magic happens. So up to this point, uh, you know, many, many tens of maybe even a hundred commissions later, it's like, um, that's gone pretty well. So, uh, and do you, um, involve them at all in the process? Like, do you send them videos or anything when you're actually making their piece or at the end, they just, you know, here it is. Um, both depending, you know what I mean? Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a client to client thing, you know, if it's, yeah. um, if it's something that they're really interested in, I'm absolutely happy to share. Um, cool. Our studio is such that there's so much going on, but it's not like I have a commission to clear out everything and just do this one piece. So right. it's hard to illustrate the whole process for someone unless we're okay. doing that at request, yeah. you know, but yeah. And you get a down payment. Yes. Yeah. No, it's a, a deposit payment is, is yeah. actually makes it. On I just always want to make sure that people know, get yeah. the payment, get a down payment before you start any work. Yeah. Before, <laughs> before the sketch, before anything, typically we do the, um, a, da a down payment just yeah. so we're both on the same page of seriousness of it. Yeah. Coming yeah. into fruition. But. Very cool. I right. thought that was very right. interesting. Go right. ahead. Last question. How do you measure success? How do you measure success? Happiness. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say happiness is a good one, but you know, happiness to me is coming and going, you know, depending on the day. I think it's, um, you know, having a sense of peace yeah. and having a sense of direction for me. Um, I would say if you have direction then you still have a path ahead of you, you know what I mean? Mm. But, as soon as you're floating around aimlessly because the direction has been lost, um, success feels like it wanes very quickly thereafter. Mm -hmm. You've got to at least know which direction you're pointed at and going for something because the peace and the happiness and the accomplishment comes along the way. And I would yeah. say 
making sure that you have a, a, a balance, like that's part of happiness because when your passion becomes your career, it's very easy to pour all of yourself into it. But if you're pouring your whole self into something, then it's hard to be able to look around and mm. it's easy to be, yeah. become lost or feel stagnant in it and and to can be get able to have balance to step back allows you to see okay the, this is where I want to go this is the next yeah. thing I want to do this is what I want for my children this is what you know I want to experience for me not just for our business or you know yeah. balance. that really resonates with me that really resonates thank you yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being on. Where can people find your work and buy a piece if they want one? Key West. Do they have to? Do they have to come to Key West? <laughs> we are online. We, we highly encourage people to <laughs> yeah. come to Key West. It's the best way to see it. But yeah. uh, we're on online keywestpottery.com. We're at Key West Pottery on most of the socials. Um, you know, just just keep up with us. We're out there and around. But the best way is come to Key West. You know. Um, running an actual brick and mortar shop is a, is a cool experience. And I think that's the quintessential way to see it. If you can. And it, it is an experience. I mean, I don't need an excuse to come back to Key West. That was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thanks guys. Thanks so right. much. And cool. thanks for being on. Yeah. Of course. Thank thanks you for, for having us. us. Yeah. We appreciate it. All right. Very cool.